Okay, so for today, uh, what I'm going to do is give an introduction to the course, specifically uh, what is machine learning. Uh, we're not going to get into um, any details of uh, anything deep uh, in, in terms of concepts, so you can sit back and, and relax. So I'm, I'm just going to introduce uh, re really the concepts. And then I'll go over as well uh, the course website and some of the logistics. And then obviously if anybody's got questions, you know, feel free to ask me anytime. Okay. Um, also, uh, let me first introduce myself. So again, my name is Pascal Poupard, so I'll be your instructor. Uh, so I'm a professor here at the University of Waterloo, so I've been a professor for 15 years. And then it turns out that my main area of research is machine learning. So I've uh, enjoyed uh, doing some work in that area for a number of years. And then uh, it's, it's also been quite interesting to see uh, the rise of interest in, in past years. So just five years ago, this course was offered roughly once a year and had maybe 30, 40 students. And today, uh, it's offered every single term. This particular term, we have 280 spots, right? And then now we have multiple machine learning courses. So, so then there's lots of enthusiasm for machine learning. So I'm really glad to see everyone. And then I guess uh, throughout this course, you'll see why machine learning has become so popular. What are some of the breakthroughs? What is all this enthusiasm coming from? Okay, so I'm a professor at the University of Waterloo, but uh, I also happen to be a, a member of the Waterloo AI Institute and also the Vector Institute. So uh, we are at a special time in history where uh, AI and machine learning specifically, again, have drawn a lot of interest. And then uh, with those institutes, there's all kinds of uh, uh, interesting opportunities um, participating in, in some of these activities as well. Now let me get into uh, the meat of, of this course, so machine learning. And then I guess the first question might be simply, what is machine learning? And also, how does that relate to computer science in general? So if we look at computer science historically, it's always been about how we can uh, come up with a set of instructions that will get the computer to uh, execute some task and, and achieve some goal that, that we would like uh, to see achieved. Right? So, so basically, um, historically, computer science is all about programming, coming up with the right set of instructions that might, uh, so I guess it's algorithms, but also data structures, but at the end of the day, as a programmer, right, you have to think through uh, what needs to be done by the computer and then essentially code that. And this is something that's not obvious, it's not easy. That's why we've got uh, entire degrees like computer science uh, that involve a substantial amount of, of programming. And, and then the art and the science of doing that are not easy, right? So everyone has taken presumably lots of courses on programming languages, data structures, algorithms, and, 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 and so on, right? But then there is still a bottleneck, right? So at the end of the day, what the computer is going to do depends heavily on what you program it to do. And if you don't have the solution, so for some problems, right, it's not obvious to come up with the right set of instructions. So then how can we get computers to do things differently? In other words, could we bypass the whole concept of writing down instructions? Right? So when you talk with a friend, right, then you can get your friend to do some task or to work with you on something, and you can just talk in plain language. And this is a lot easier. You don't have to take a course. You don't have to do a whole degree on how to talk to people, right? So then the question would be, for computers, is there a different way that we could do things that would not involve necessarily coming up with a set of instructions? OK, and so this is where machine learning comes in. So uh, we are now in a new paradigm where what happens is that you can actually get computers to perform some fairly complex tasks just by providing them with a bunch of examples. So here, uh, to be concrete, let's say that we want to do machine translation, then we can provide um, some pairs of sentences. Uh, so it could be a sentence in English, another one um, in German, or otherwise in French. And then the idea is that if you provide millions of those examples, 
and then the computer can learn to discover the right patterns, the right rules, and essentially come up with its own set of instructions about how to take as input one language and produce a translation as the other uh, output. Right, so, so this is remarkable because historically, how do we do translation? Well, we, we get translators, we get people to, to do this, and if we want to automate that, well, you can come up with a bunch of instructions, uh, a bunch of if-then-else rules that would say, okay, if you see this word, perhaps replace it by that word, and then if you see this construction, perhaps it means that. So you can come up with lots of cases like that, uh, a very complex set of rules, but this generally does not work. It does not work because language is something that's rich, and, and then uh, we usually are not able to come up with all possible cases. So coming up with the rules for translation manually has never worked well. So today the state of the art is true machine learning, where you essentially feed the computer with a bunch of examples, and then you don't program it directly. What you do is you program it at a meta level, where you teach it to essentially learn from examples how to figure out what is the right set of instructions. So that's the beauty of, of machine learning. And then so this is just one concrete example, but then another complex task would be, let's say in computer vision, where we have, let's say, uh, a scene with some objects. Uh, like let's say we want to detect some cars, some people, some buildings, and, and so on then for us as humans, when, when we see an, an image, it's easy, we can tell what's in the image, but then for a computer, an image is essentially a sequence of pixel values, so it's a really long vector, and now if you try to write down some rules to essentially recognize what those pixels represent, um, the pixel values are just numbers, so it's not easy even for humans to provide uh, some rules for that. So people in computer vision have worked for decades on, on trying to do this, and again, same story, um, because we can't think of all the edge cases, because uh, images are complex, right, then uh, this has never worked really well. And the state of the art today is that you feed the computer with both examples of images, and then what needs to be extracted as the output, and then the computer will learn uh, essentially uh, a program, a set of instructions to go from the input to the output. Okay, any questions regarding this? All right, let's continue. Okay, so now, um, based on this, we can consider several definitions for machine learning. And then uh, what I just explained was actually captured already in 1959 by Arthur Samuel, who said that machine learning is the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So when you think about this, this is remarkable because uh, for most people, machine learning, artificial intelligence is just something recent. At least in the public, it's really just in the last five years or so that people have become aware of machine learning and, 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 and so on. But then the field has been in existence for much longer. So machine learning and artificial intelligence goes back to the 1950s. And already back then, uh, people had this idea that someday we should be able to get a computer to learn from examples as opposed to just program it. And so Arthur Samuel had already foreseen this. Okay, so, so this is nice, but it's still um, not telling us precisely what are the important components that perhaps make up what might be a, a, a machine learning algorithm or machine learning task. So in 1998, Tom Mitchell published a book in which he included the following definition. A computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of task T and performance measure P if its performance at task in T as measured by P improves with experience E. Okay, so this is a long definition. It's a bit of a mouthful, right? But then um, it does highlight three important components that we're going to see throughout the course that are very important essentially for any type of, of machine learning. So in general, with machine learning, we, we um, essentially get a computer to learn from experience, which means that it's going to learn from data. Okay, so we're gonna have data, uh, and that's the starting point. 
Then the task, uh, that could be machine translation, it could be um, object recognition, it could be stock trading. Uh, so there's lots of examples of tasks where essentially we're going to provide examples and then we're going to uh, get the computer to learn to figure out what to do to produce the right output. Okay, and then so, so there is a task um, and then that task usually there will be with it some performance measure and this is how we're going to tell how well the computer does but also this is what's going to drive the learning. So we're going to get computer programs to optimize this performance measure um, and then we're going to see that a lot of the algorithms are essentially based on some form of optimization technique in terms of optimizing uh, an appropriate performance measure. Okay, any questions regarding those definitions? Okay, very good, let's continue. All right, so now, um, if we look into machine learning more carefully, uh, there are, generally speaking, three broad categories of algorithms. Um, so the first category is what is known as supervised learning, the second, unsupervised learning, and then the third one, reinforcement learning. So here, uh, supervised learning means that we provide the computer with some data that includes both the input and the output. So it's a bit like you see, when you take a course, uh, depending on what the topic is, uh, the professor or the instructor might provide you with some examples to practice, right? Where you're going to have what is the input and then what is the output, what is the answer that you need to provide, right? So when that happens, you could think of this as a form of supervised learning because you're provided with the answer and, and then you simply need to uh, figure out on your own how to come up with that answer. But at least you're provided with the answer and that's a lot easier. Right? So, so then, yeah, supervised learning will be this setting where we will give the computer the answer as part of the training set, and then what it needs to do is to come up with the rules or to come up with a program to be able to produce answers of this sort in, in the future. Um, okay, so we're going to see some examples in a moment, uh, but that's at a high level for, for supervised learning. Now, unsupervised learning is this harder setting where the computer is not provided with the answer. Okay, so we provide it with some data, and then typically this would include some tasks like clustering or um, coming up with some features or coming up with a model that can explain the data. So it's a more uh, open-ended discovery type of uh, task and, and here, there is no answer that is known ahead of time that we provide to the computer. So in that sense, it's, it's a lot harder, but still, um, we're going to see some algorithms that can perform this type of exploration, this type of, of discovery. Um, okay, the third one, reinforcement learning, is kind of in between. Okay, so with supervised learning, you're provided with data and including the answer, what the computer has to produce. In unsupervised learning, there is no output that's provided, but then in reinforcement learning, you're provided with a numerical signal that indicates how good uh, the computer, how good is what the computer came up with. So we're gonna see in a moment that there's a notion of rewards in reinforcement learning, which is a numerical signal. You can think of it as a score. It's a bit like if you, um, uh, practice uh, for a course with some examples and then instead of being told here's the correct answer somebody just gives you a score and then the higher the score is for each answer the better and perhaps there's no notion of having a perfect score which would tell you that you have the right answer it's just that you're told here's a score it's a number and the score could be fairly high, but you know, the higher the better, and you just have to keep on trying, okay? So, so reinforcement learning is essentially this setting where um, there's a, a piece of feedback, so, so it's, it's, it's better than unsupervised learning where there's no feedback, and, but it's, it's worse than supervised learning because the feedback only tells us how good that is, but doesn't tell us what is the right answer. 
OK, so that's at a high level. Now I'm going to go into more details about uh, each one of them. OK, so we're going to start with supervised learning. And just to make things concrete, let's have a look at a very simple problem that was actually quite important a few decades ago. And it was this problem of recognizing digits um, as part of a, a postal code. So you can imagine several decades ago when mail was still very important. Today, I mean, we've got email, we've got text messages, and so on. And I, I guess you can still order some packages of the web, and then you know they need to come through regular mail. Uh, so, but then back in the days, um, when somebody would write a piece of mail, they would write down the address by hand, right? And then when you would send the mail, they would essentially be a large army of people who would be responsible for just sorting out the mail and deciding where each mail should go. Essentially, which plane or which truck it should get onto and, and, and so on, based on the address that, that was written. And then, so this was very inefficient. It was very time consuming. So an important task was, can we simply recognize automatically what is the postal code? So, so that uh, boils down to the problem of recognizing handwritten digits as well as characters. Okay, so here we've got some examples. Um, so you can, you can see that each image is a bitmap that corresponds to a handwritten digit. Okay, so, so now the question is if we want to recognize these digits automatically, what's a good way of doing this? Right, and here coming up with a bunch of if then else rules based on which um, pixels are turned on or off. I uh, could work to some extent, but is not robust, OK? Um, so, so yeah, so then the question is, what, what would be a simple way that one could consider to do this type of digit recognition? In, any ideas? OK, this is not a, a difficult question. Um, so if you wanted to recognize uh, what is the digit in a new bitmap? And then you have already seen some examples. What might be the simplest thing that, that you could try? Yes? Maybe find the image that is closest to the one that you already saw. Right, so yeah, so if we already have a data set, right, then we could store that data set and then we could try to see if the new image matches any of the image that we have in our data set and, and chances are it won't match, so then find the nearest neighbor. Okay, so, so then I, I guess yeah, the simplest approach could actually be some form of memorization where, again, you, you have some examples. Uh, so here I've got five zeros, five ones, five twos, but let's imagine that I have thousands, if not millions of them, okay? And then I store them all, so I have this in, in my memory, and then whenever I get a new bitmap, then I could compare it to all of those that I have in my memory. If I have a match, then I know the answer because it's part of the memory, right? So, so this would be a, uh, an, an instance of memorization, and in fact, you know, when you learn, Right? Often, uh, you'll go through this exercise of just remembering by heart certain concepts. Right? So memorization could be one of the simplest form of learning, but it's not a great form of learning. Because if all you do is memorize, right, then you won't be able to generalize to anything further. And then anything that you haven't stored in your memory, you won't know what to, to do with it. Yes? Right, so yeah, so here, I guess, yeah, when I say memorization, it would be looking for an exact match. And, and then what's the obvious problem in, in terms of looking for an exact match? What, what's going to happen in terms of scalability? Yes. Yeah, so if it's one bit off, we don't have a match. And then how many bitmaps could there be in total? Right, so here it's very simple, but it, it would still be, I guess, two to the number of bits in the bitmap, uh, so it, it, it would be intractable, right? So uh, we could not store all possible bitmaps and, and label them all. There, there's too many of them. Okay, so, so then uh, the approach that was suggested earlier is to perhaps simply compare 
a, 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 a query bitmap to those that we have in our data set and find the closest one. Okay, so let's say that I have a query. I'd like to recognize what is this digit and then I have a data set, so in other words a database of existing bitmaps and for each one of them I already know the label. So those are ones, then these are twos, threes, fours, etc. Right, so, so now I find the closest one, so perhaps I find that this uh, bitmap is closest to this one, and because this one is labeled a 4, then I just return 4. Okay, so this approach of nearest neighbor is actually a very simple machine learning technique, um, and then we're going to, uh, in fact, start the course by discussing this technique, what are some of the properties and, 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 and so on. So here it's, it's, not, it's not the most exciting technique, but it's still an important simple technique that for a lot of problems you should actually consider. So you know, before going straight to a deep neural network, right, then sometimes it's actually good to start with simple techniques, see if they work, and often simple techniques can be quite robust, will scale and, and, and so on. And nearest neighbor is always a good one to start with. So for some applications, it, it's actually sufficient. Okay, any questions regarding this? All right, let's continue. Okay, so now more formally, based on what I just described, we could say that supervised learning could be um, uh, conceptualize as follows. So we're given a training set of examples and those examples we're going to say that they are of the form x which is the input with an associated output f of x. Okay, so we're going to have pairs of inputs outputs and the problem is we would like to find a function h that approximates the function f that was used to produce the output. So here, just to be clear, the function f, we don't have it, okay? So it's a, it, it, it's a function that we assume exists, right? So like in the example of digit recognition, right, it would be the function that takes as input the bitmap and then produces as output the correct label. So we know that it exists uh, simply because as humans we see bitmaps we can produce the correct label, or at least most of the time we can, right? So, so then there must be such a function that exists, right? That function is not obvious, but in everybody's brain, right, it's there, right? So now the question is, can we get the computer to find this function, or otherwise at least find a function that will come as close as possible? Now because we don't know f, we'll never know f, I mean even if it's in our brains, right, we, we can't quite extract it. So, so then what we'll do is simply find a function h, we're going to call it a hypothesis, and then the goal will be to find an h that, that approximates f as well as possible. But then again, we don't have f. All we're going to have is really the, those pairs of inputs and outputs where we assume that the output was produced by the function f, um, so it's just a mathematical construct here, right? So we don't have f. Any questions regarding this? Okay, very good, let's continue. Okay, so with this, um, this type of uh, supervised learning, a common task would be to do prediction. So in other words, we might have uh, some examples of data points where we have the input that corresponds to the x-axis, the output that corresponds to the y-axis, and now with those examples, we'd like to come up with a function such that if I give you a new input, you can predict what is going to be the output. Okay, so we can think of essentially supervised learning as fitting a function that allows you to extrapolate so that given any new input, right, you can make a prediction for what the output is going to be. Okay, so if we have data of this sort, then uh, we could try to fit different types of functions. And, and then so we could start by considering, let's say, linear functions. And then this could be a, 
a, a reasonable function, right? So it's a line. And now it, it doesn't go through every data point, so maybe we could consider other functions, right? So we could consider this uh, a curve function. Perhaps it's um, maybe a quadratic function. It goes through most of the data points, but not all of them. So if we really want to go through all of them, maybe we could consider this blue function, which uh, could be a higher degree polynomial. But that's not the only one. We could also consider this nice yellow function as well. OK, so now the question is, with respect to all of those functions, which one is the correct one? So I'd like everyone to think about this and raise your hand to vote for one of those functions. OK, so if we go back, um, the red function, which is linear, who prefers this function? Who thinks that this is the right function? OK, so we've got a few people. Very good. Now, if we consider the green one, which let's say is a quadratic function, who would say that this is the right function? OK, several more people. Uh, now, what about this blue function that goes through every data point? So who would say that this is the right function? OK, so we've got a few people, but less than the green one. And then finally, we've got this nice yellow function. So who prefers this function? OK, we've got one person who is confident. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. OK, so, so now you can see the class is divided, right? OK, we've got maybe a strong preference. I think most of the people have voted for the green one, but the class is divided. So can anybody indicate some reasons for why they voted in a certain way? Yes. OK, so you're raising several good points. right? So we don't want to have curves that are going to overfit. This is an important concept that we're going to see later in the course. And then there might also be some outliers. So for instance, um, if I just go back, right? so this point here might just be an outlier. So if we think it's an outlier, then maybe we don't have to have our curve go through that point. right? So that would justify, perhaps, uh, the green curve or the, ye uh, or the red curve. OK. Um, and anybody could uh, indicate a reason for the blue curve or also the, the yellow curve? Yes? Yeah, very good point. So here, I guess it comes back to this question of, are there outliers or not? If we think that there are no outliers, or if we think that our data is fairly accurate, right? then that's a point that we hope to have a curve that goes through uh, that, that point. And, and therefore, the, the blue and, and the yellow curve would be reasonable. OK, so, so here it, it turns out that there's no perfect answer. OK, so all of those curves can be justified from some perspective as being the correct curve. And, and this illustrates what makes as well machine learning difficult. So, so in machine learning, it turns out that there is a theorem known as the no free lunch theorem that essentially says that you cannot learn from nothing. You have to make some assumptions initially. You have to have what is known as an inductive bias. And here, this inductive bias, this initial prior assumption, might be in the form of, do I think that I have an outlier or not? It could also be, do I think that the underlying uh, curve follows um, a certain parametric form. Maybe I'm actually expecting here a linear relation, and therefore the space of linear functions is all I need to consider, and then the, uh, the red curve would, would be the right one. Or maybe I know that my, the relation that I'm looking for is not linear. I, I do expect it to be quadratic or maybe even to be polynomial to some degree. And, and therefore, uh, the, um, the green curve and the blue curve would be justified. And now we could even justify the yellow curve. What if I tell you that these data points are essentially stock prices 
And if you look at the stock market, often it follows some type of Brownian motion, and then there's a, a, a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, changes in, in direction. So the yellow curve could actually be the right one if, if it happens to be stock market data. Right? So, so I guess, yeah, the bottom line is that um, it will be generally difficult. We'll have to make some assumption, and, and then we'll, we'll never really know for sure what, what is the, the correct curve, but it'll be based on those assumptions that we'll be able to decide. So data is not enough in, in general. Okay, so um, now the other aspect um, of machine learning that is really interesting uh, really powerful, but at the same time really challenging, is this concept of generalization. So in general, we'll want to come up with some hypothesis that works well with respect to the data. So if you recall again, the hypothesis is going to be the function that we come up with to explain the data, the function that goes through uh, most of our data. Right Now this hypothesis, we're going to see that it's good if it generalizes well, okay? And here generalizing well is going to be with respect to unseen examples. So somehow we'll want this hypothesis to be good at predicting unseen examples correctly. Okay, so, so this is really challenging. I mean, this is the same as what you do when you take a course and you're learning Right, so there's some concepts, there's some material, you're studying, you're going through the examples, but at the end of the course, there's a final exam, and you know the instructor is gonna ask you some questions that are not in any of the examples, they're not in the textbook, they're not in any of the material, and yet you have to be able to answer those questions. Why does the instructor do this? It's not that the instructor is just mean, okay? Uh, the reason is that this shows that if you can answer questions beyond what is literally said in the material of the course, then you've uh, understood the concept, and now you can generalize and apply those concepts to new examples, right? So the same thing here, right? We want our algorithms to be able to make some predictions with respect to new data points, and therefore the criteria for determining whether an algorithm is good will be how well does it do at generalizing, at making correct predictions on new data points. Okay, any questions regarding this? Okay, in any case, we're going to see in more detail throughout the course how we can achieve this type of generalization, but this is what makes machine learning both really difficult, but at the same time really exciting, and this is what really allows learning to be effective because you're not just memorizing something, you're actually training a, an algorithm to be able to perform well at a task on examples that it hasn't seen before. Okay, now I said that we need to often make some assumption uh, or we need to explore prior knowledge that in machine learning we cannot just use data. So often, in terms of uh, making some assumptions, we'll want to consider perhaps what is known as Occam's razor, which says that we prefer the simplest hypothesis consistent with the data. Okay, so we have some data, we can verify how well uh, our hypothesis is doing with respect to that data, but now if there's multiple hypotheses that seem to perform well with respect to the data, use the simplest one. This is, this is just an assumption, it doesn't always work, but most of the time it works well because if you look at the laws in nature, they tend to be simple. So nature tends to prefer simpler states. We also tend to prefer simpler explanations. So if you can come up with a simple um, rule or a simple function, then it might generalize better than complex ones. Okay, so, so often that's, that's what we'll do. Okay, so let's go back to supervised learning. And now beyond just digit recognition, um, if we really want to see the power of generalization, right, then we might as well consider some natural images. And now we could consider um, some, uh, a, a large variety of, of possible classes. So several years ago, um, there was a, a data set that was created. It was called ImageNet. And then this data set had uh, millions of um, images with corresponding classes. 
and the total number of classes in that data set was more than a thousand. Now with this data set there was a, a comparison that was created and then researchers were asked to design an algorithm that could essentially perform well at the task of recognizing what is the class of the main objects in each image. So here we've got some examples. So this is an image where there's a mite. Uh, here we've got a container ship, a motor scooter, a leopard, and so on. So, so then in that competition, right, there was data of this sort. Um, the number of classes was restricted to 1,000, and then the number of images was also restricted to 1 million. And then participants had to essentially try to uh, come up with an algorithm that can classify those images as well as possible. So, so then this is a, a form of supervised learning because you have both the image and the correct class, and here the correct class was obtained by human labeling, right? So somebody would just go through each image and, and identify what is in that image. Okay, so, so then with this, um, you can uh, get uh, a computer to essentially do machine learning, come up with its own rules, and, and eventually figure out a mapping from images to, to the classes. And, and today, this is how most of um, the work in, in scene understanding, scene analysis works, is, is through machine learning and, and often via supervised learning. Okay, any questions regarding this? All right, let's continue. Okay, so now let me consider as well unsupervised learning. So this is uh, the second form of machine learning that is harder because we are not provided, or at least we do not provide the computer with the labels or what is the output. Okay, so in this case, the training set corresponds to inputs alone, but no output. So what the task is, is often to find a model that explains the data and more precisely, this could mean to find some clusters, to find a compressed representation, to find features, or to find a generative model that could be used to produce more data like the ones that we have in, in our data set. Okay, so as a concrete um, uh, example, so I've got here what is known as an autoencoder. Um, it could be used, for instance, to find a compressed representation. So here, imagine that you feed the computer with, again, some bitmaps that correspond to digits, but now the goal is not to classify those bitmaps, but just to compress them. Okay, so I mean, it's a common problem where you want to compress images, compress videos, compress data in general, right? And when you do this, you would like to do it in a way where you don't lose information. So if you set up a system where it is an encoder that's responsible for the compression, and then there's a decoder that's responsible for essentially trying to reconstruct the input, and then you can verify that afterwards the output is more or less the same as the input, then it means that your encoder has actually found a compressed representation that does not lose any information. So this is beautiful, right? So, so this is an example of of some form of unsupervised learning because the output that we want here is the compressed representation, but nobody provided the computer any examples of what that compressed representation should look like. And traditionally, if you want to do compression, there's lots of techniques um, that are based on traditional method in computer science, but you can also use a machine learning technique like this, where the idea is that you're going to optimize the encoder and the decoder to make sure that the output is as close as possible to the input and the, this intermediate layer here perhaps has much smaller dimensionality. All right, so you take an image that's thousands to millions of pixels, so that's a very long vector, right? And now if you design the encoder to produce an intermediate vector that might have hundreds to thousands of dimensions, then it's a reduction in dimensionality, it's a compression, and then if this is sufficient to reconstruct afterwards what the input was, then you haven't lost any information. Okay? Any questions regarding this example? 
OK, good. So in any case, we'll see later throughout the course um, uh, autoencoders as well as various forms of encoder decoders. And in fact, this is an important model that has become a key to a lot of uh, machine translation system as well as conversational agents. Okay, another example of um, unsupervised machine learning would be, uh, let's say that we feed in, again, images. Um, so this could be the, uh, uh, a, a, a deep neural network that has uh, uh, several layers where the size of each layer decreases. So essentially, we're, we're, uh, we could think of this as some sort of encoder again that produces a compressed representation. But now instead of feeding in just digits, maybe I just feed in some arbitrary images, maybe from ImageNet. So this would be images from lots of classes. Okay? And so some researchers tried that. And then they notice that in this neural network, and we're going to see later in the course how neural networks are designed, what those nodes represent, but for now at a high level, the idea is that each node here would be computing something. And then um, when a node computes something, it produces an output, so a numerical signal that can vary in strength. And now we could ask, what type of images would trigger this node from firing, in other words, would trigger it in a way that it would produce a large signal, a high value. And then some researchers inspected then the type of images that do get this node to, to fire. And then in some cases, the node um, was, was firing with, with, with respect to certain patterns, images that, that have a pattern, like for instance, a diagonal line. So historically in computer vision, it was actually quite common to uh, design technique that would first do some form of feature extraction, like extracting edges, extracting corners, so some very small low-level features like this. And now with deep neural network, a big thing is that we don't have to specify those features by hand. The computer can learn them automatically. Okay, so some nodes in the deep neural networks sometimes can be interpreted as firing mostly with respect to s certain patterns of inputs, like for instance, a little diagonal line. Now you might say, well, maybe this is not too important. I mean, little diagonal line, maybe this is just some kind of fluke. But then there were other nodes that were inspected where they were firing with respect to images that look more or less like this. So in other words, images that correspond to faces. And then uh, there was another node that tend to fire whenever the input was a cat image. Okay, so the idea is that in um, some large data set, if you have lots of uh, images that are faces, lots of images that are cats, then it's going to be natural that some nodes are going to fire with respect to certain types of inputs. And then, so there's an implicit form of clustering that happens here. And this is what this shows here. Okay, so those nodes were not asked specifically to fire when they see a cat or when they see a face, but the neural network evolved naturally in this fashion, and this was all done in a completely unsupervised way. So yeah, we'll see in more details uh, techniques um, that can achieve this, this sort of thing. Any questions regarding this? Uh, well, so, so here it's more like you feed an image, and if that image happens to have um, a, a diagonal line, uh, let's say in some patch, right, then uh, this node is likely to fire, in other words, to produce a high value. Okay. Now here I'm not saying that when this happens that this would then lead to another node firing in a way that corresponds to a a face, so this could be just something separate. So this one tends to fire when, again, the input tends to correspond to a face. Yeah, and, and so I guess these are just three examples, but they're not linked together per se. So it would be more concrete as the thought process. Well, yeah, so what tends to happen is that in terms of features, right, near the input, we tend to observe lower level features 
And then um, further down in the network, we tend to observe higher level features. And then um, depending on how this network is trained, um, then you might observe things that actually correspond more or less to classes or clusters of the data. And, and that, that's what this represents. But yeah, there is generally a progression of lower level to higher level uh, in, into networks. Yeah. Yes? Um, okay, so I don't remember the details uh, from the original work here. Uh, what I do remember is that it was um, uh, trained in an unsupervised way, which generally means that um, there was probably uh, some objective in terms of data reconstruction. Um, and um, uh, so yeah, so here this was a, a network that was not trained for any specific task. It just so happened that it evolved in this way uh, so that it could, I guess, explain or reconstruct the data. So it would be just something like a compressed model but doesn't mean anything? Yeah, so you could think of it as a compressed model that captures, I guess, the relevant factors or the relevant features that make this data uh, the way it is. Okay, so let's talk about the third form of machine learning known as reinforcement learning. And here, um, a good way of abstracting reinforcement learning is using this picture. So imagine that your computer is an agent. And so as a concrete example, perhaps it's, it's an agent or it's a player in a game. And then at every step in this game, the agent and needs to execute some action, so the computer will produce an output that corresponds to the action choice to be executed. Then the environment uh, will change as a result of this action. So in the game, if the player executes a certain move, then the state of the game changes. And then uh, some information will be observed by the agent about this new state of the game, and perhaps as well some signal that will indicate how good is this new state. So if you, for instance, if um, uh, it's, it's a computer playing Go or it's a computer playing a video game, right, then um, as part of the game, there might be some points for, let's say, killing some enemies, or you might lose some points whenever you get hurt into a battle, or you might win a lot of points for winning the game at the end. So, so then rewards corresponds like this to a numerical signal that indicates how good are the actions. Okay, so, so then in this setting, um, for reinforcement learning, the, the problem is that the computer needs to learn how to select actions in order to maximize the reward. So the reward is essentially telling it how good are the actions, and then it needs to maximize that. Okay, so reinforcement learning um, comes from animal psychology. So the term reinforcement learning refers to this idea that historically, uh, people would often train animals through reinforcement, right? So uh, you want to get your dog or your cat to behave in a certain way, right? Then you might uh, reinforce certain behaviors uh, through various tactics. Okay, so some tactics might include negative reinforcements where you might hit the animal, so that would induce pain, or you might starve it. Maybe that's not such a good idea, but in any case, you, you can uh, in, induce uh, some behaviors through negative reinforcements, as well as positive reinforcement. Whenever the animal does something good, then you might provide it with some food, and you might pet it, right? So, so then, uh, over time, the animal would learn to behave in a way that would maximize, I guess, the positive reinforcements and minimize the negative reinforcements. Okay, so this is what we do with animals. I mean, animals at some level, we can't give them a set of instructions, right? Uh, if, if this was not an animal, this was a person, you could just talk to the person, right? And then say, okay, can you do X, right? But then with an animal, how do you get the animal to do X, right, when you cannot talk directly to the animal. I guess you can talk, but the animal most of the time won't understand. So, so then some form of reinforcement can help a lot, right? So, so then with computers, can we design a form of learning that would be based on reinforcements? And the answer is yes. 
So here, what we can do is provide a numerical signal that simply indicates how good are different actions at different points in time, and then simply design a computer program that will essentially try to select actions to maximize those rewards. Right? So, so then the environment provides some rewards, and then um, if you design a program to maximize those rewards, then the, the algorithm will naturally evolve to select better and better actions over time. That's the idea. OK, so very concretely, um, there was uh, an important success a few years ago uh, with respect to Computer Go. OK, so Computer Go is one of the oldest and hardest board games uh, for humans. Uh, so in this game, you have two players. One player has the black stones, another player has the white stones. And then uh, the idea is that they alternate, placing one stone at a time on an empty intersection. And the goal is to essentially capture as much territory as possible. So here, territory is captured, or at least considered to be owned by one player, when a player has some stones that surround some area. So like this area, right? could be declared to be owned by black. Right? And then this area here could be declared to be owned by white because white surrounds that. OK, so, so in this game, it turns out that the rules are extremely simple. At every turn, you put down one stone on an empty intersection. And then when you surround some stones from the opponent, you capture them. And otherwise, if the intersections are empty, then that territory uh, more or less belongs to you. Okay, so, so the rules are extremely simple, but then the strategies are very, very complex. And, and that's why this game is actually quite interesting. So, so yeah, so humans have been playing this game in Asia for centuries. Uh, it's, it's a renowned game. And then recently, in 2016, DeepMind uh, wrote a program that essentially um, ended up beating some of the best human players uh, at the game of Go. And this was done through reinforcement learning. OK, so we can model this game as a reinforcement learning problem. Uh, simply by saying that the agent is the player, so that would be the computer system. The environment could be the opponent. A state is a board configuration like this. An action could be the next stone that the player could put down. And then there's a reward for winning versus losing. So plus one for winning, minus one for losing. Uh, this is a very simple way of framing this as a reinforcement learning problem. However, if you play Go, I mean, you, uh, you can get more points. I mean, the number of points is normally uh, in direct relation to how many intersections you control. So it's not just plus one, minus one. But at the end of the, game, at the, end of the day, you either win or lose. And then we could simplify the rewards to just be plus one or minus one for winning versus losing. OK, so in 2016, DeepMind developed an algorithm called AlphaGo. And it defeated one of the top players called Lee Seedal uh, by winning four matches out of five. And now you could say, well, how did it do this? Was it um, you, yeah, what type of machine learning was used here? And then perhaps the simplest way of approaching this problem is to actually view it as a supervised learning problem because there are uh, databases of board configurations with the move that an expert has selected. And then we could simply train um, a, a computer program to essentially mimic how humans are playing. The problem with this is that if you want to beat humans, just mimicking how they're playing is not going to get you to, to play better than, than humans, right? So, so we need a technique that can go beyond just mimicking how humans are, are playing. And reinforcement learning can provide this. So in fact, uh, in this um, uh, competition, so at game two, move 37, AlphaGo played a move that was considered unexpected. So when AlphaGo made that move, move 37, it positioned a stone somewhere that no human expert would normally play. So at the time, 
uh, the analyst actually thought that the computer made a mistake. Uh, so this was the immediate reaction from everyone. Um, but then, uh, after a few minutes, the analyst started asking, well, could it be possible that the machine just figured out a move that is good, but people would not normally play? And it turned out that this was exactly what happened. Okay, so, so this move turned out to be a, a, a move that humans would only play with odds 1 in 10,000, and therefore experts would never play this um, uh, normally. Uh, so that's why it was considered a mistake. But this move turned out to be a good move. So it was a different strategy than what human players would normally follow. And it turned out to be a decisive move that allowed AlphaGo to win afterwards. Okay, so now how is that possible? So with reinforcement learning, what happens is that um, the computer was essentially training to play against itself, and then it would give itself plus one for winning, minus one for losing, and therefore it would explore different ways of playing that could be quite different than how humans would play, and then, uh, because it was continuously playing against older versions of itself, it always made sure that it could play well against all of these uh, uh, strong players that were previous versions of itself, and that were not necessarily just uh, the type of moves that humans would do. And so it was through reinforcement learning that this was achieved. And if it wasn't for reinforcement learning, it's, it's not clear. It would have been very difficult for the, the computer to beat humans, right? It, it's a bit like you see, you have a master, you have a, a, a student, and then how can the student you know, uh, go beyond and further than the master, then the student needs to eventually discover new strategies that the master would not think about. And, and then reinforcement learning allows this, but not supervised learning. Yes? Wait, so it, it, it still gives you like, supervised learning, like, like some reports. Yeah, so OK, uh, AlphaGo, uh, when you read about um, the papers that describe how it works, there is indeed a first stage of supervised learning that precisely takes databases of board configurations with um, what is an, an expert move. But then when you look at the results for that first stage in those papers, right? I mean, they're OK results, but it's far from beating any human expert. OK, so, so this was not going to be enough. And, and then it was only through reinforcement learning that was added afterwards that then the computer was able to go beyond human experts. Yeah, so it did do both, but then, okay, uh, you could ask how important was the supervised learning part, and then there was another version of, of AlphaGo called AlphaZero that does only reinforcement learning, no supervised learning, and then ended up being even better than AlphaGo. So AlphaZero that does pure reinforcement learning ended up doing better than AlphaGo. Yeah. Okay, yeah, great question. So yeah, here, can we, uh, well, can reinforcement learning find the optimal solution? So here, it, th this, this really depends on the algorithm and also the problem. So in the, in the case of um, Computer Go, yeah, at the moment, we do not have the perfect or optimal solution. Uh, so in the case of chess, uh, this has been figured out. Uh, this would require some sort of exhaustive search, um, but then uh, computer Go is, is, is too large to, to do that. So what reinforcement learning does is to do some form of optimization to yeah, continuously improve, but we do not have any guarantees that it has found the global optimum, and I doubt very much that it has. There's probably still some very special cases where it could further improve and maybe somebody could, could defeat it. 
Uh, but okay, you're also making a good point that in other settings, like in control engineering, often you have a problem where you can derive mathematically uh, what could be an optimal solution. So in that case, if you can indeed find an optimal solution mathematically and all already understand how to do that, then presumably you don't need reinforcement learning. But in practice, what tends to happen is that those settings where people derive mathematically what appears to be an optimal solution, they often make assumptions about the problem. They often ignore all kinds of sources of noise, all kinds of um, edge cases. And then the reality is that those equations are not optimal. They, they are optimal with respect to an idealistic, simplest, uh, simplistic setting, but then for the practical setting, they usually aren't. So then reinforcement learning has a chance to essentially uh, discover what to do even in those situations of noise or those situations where the math uh, doesn't tell us what, what to do. So that's, that's the beauty of this. And this is where there's a lot of interest in combining, I guess, um, techniques from control engineering where you already know uh, what could be a good starting model, find a good reasonable solution, and then after that evolve it to make it even more robust, to make it even better uh, with respect to all these edge conditions. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So. We have um, lots of applications of machine learning. Um, I've already mentioned a few. Um, now, there have been breakthroughs in speech recognition. Uh, so then you find essentially machine learning at the core of Siri and Cortana. We talked about machine translation. There's also question answering, dialogue systems. We talked about computer vision. That includes, generally speaking, image and video analysis. Robotic control, like um, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, lots of machine learning that is used at the core for that too. Um, intelligent agents that can do activity recognition or recommend uh, various uh, products or, or various things for, for users, also based on machine learning. And computational finance, uh, stock trading, portfolio optimization, uh, lots of the work in fintech as well as driven by machine learning. So this is not an exhaustive list, but this gives you a sense of some of the applications. Um, and then in general, again, the beauty is that wherever there's a hard task, and then instead of writing instructions, you could just provide data to the computer, then there's a chance that machine learning could essentially uh, yield a breakthrough. Okay, so for this course, um, I'm going to focus um, mostly on supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Uh, there's lots of material. We talked as well about reinforcement learning, but I won't be uh, going into more details about reinforcement learning in this course. If you're interested in reinforcement learning, I did teach a course last summer, uh, CS885. You can check out the website. All the material is there. And then there's also video lectures, so all the lectures were recorded, so you can go and, 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 and watch that. Now, if some of you would like a reinforcement learning course that will happen in the future, as opposed to just looking at material from the past, um, we do have our general AI course, which is CS486 and CS686, that does include a little bit of reinforcement learning, so you can get that. It's offered every term. And then I do hope to uh, teach this course again in, in the future, but uh, the schedules have, have not been made. Okay? In any case, so what this means is that, um, again, there's too much material for us to cover. I had to pick and choose, and then so we will uh, focus the course on supervised and unsupervised learning, but then you can get reinforcement learning at, at this website. Okay, any questions regarding the slides? Okay, very good. Oh, one question, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I just have a question about Move 37 for uh, the Go. Yes, yeah, so Move 37, so yeah. So is it possible that AlphaGo made a mistake on Move 37 but won anyway? So in other words, how critical was that move to make when you came to? Okay, so I'm, I'm not an expert in Go. Uh, there were, at the time of the tournament, analysts. So this um, uh, was um, broadcasted at the time. Uh, so the competition happened in Korea, 
it was broadcasted in Korea and then also uh, in English. There were experts both on the Korean and the English side who were Go experts and then they did an analysis at the time and then also there was a post analysis done and today people uh, view the move that AlphaGo did as being a good move. So a lot of people confirmed that this, this was a good move.